Uh, thanks, Matthias, once again, all yours. Thanks. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be virtually with all of you. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm going to talk about neural rendering because I think it's a really cool field. Um, during the talk, if there's any questions, I managed now to pull up my Zoom chat. So if any questions arise, like just feel free to, to, to post something in the chat, but also feel free to just interrupt me. Um, if you do interrupt me, what would be nice if you could turn on your video so I know who I'm talking with. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I'm just going to start right away. And yeah, we've been talking in the community right now a lot about neural rendering. And one of the big questions is, what is neural rendering actually, right? And um, I'm trying to use this a little bit as an icebreaker right now. So if anybody has some ideas, um, I don't know what, what people think about it, feel free to post some definitions in the chat. I'm curious also to hear from you guys. Um, yeah, what, what is covered by neural rendering and what, and, you know, what, what, what is covered by technically, but also application-wise. Um, so I think, um, obviously, there's a term neural in there, right, which says, well, there should be some neural networks, there should be something that is learned in principle. Um, but I think I'm going to show you that neural rendering is not only learning things. And um, despite that everybody talks about AI, I think most of the cutting edge things in that field are actually not based on any learning. They're, there's no learning, there's no generalization for most of these methods, actually, um, that produce producing a lot of good results. So I don't know, does anybody have some some thoughts how, how they would define neural rendering? Is there any any opinion? There's a thing on chat. Rendering, rendering neural networks, uh, rendering using neural networks. I guess that's a fair fair definition. I think that's, that's what I have too. I have also neural rendering, give me an image. <laughs> um, any, any other ideas? Anybody else? All right. I mean, let, let's keep it like this. I think it's a good it's a good definition. It's a pretty broad definition, um, but I think it, it doesn't cover actually everything. So we'll hopefully see a few of these things. Um, so one of the big questions is why neural rendering? Um, so especially, I mean, this is pretty funny always like um, in academia, what often happens is you have a series. So you have a, a bunch of PhD students in one generation and they can kind of, they get already some bias in a sense of what, what they're seeing is kind of the hot topics in their field. Um, so, but if you had asked somebody in, I don't know, like 10 years ago in computer graphics and, you know, you, you talked about, certainly speaking about rendering, rendering for the most part means you take a 3D model, you run a graphics pipeline, either rasterizer, either ray tracer, and you're generating an image from your 3D representation, right? Um, so the big question is, why do we need neural networks to help this process of rendering images from whatever representation we're going to use? Why don't we just use computer graphics? Um, because we know how computer graphics works. I think in, in computer graphics, rendering is, is, I wouldn't say it's completely researched, right? There's still open questions, but I think the basic algorithms, they are mostly known. And so this raises the questions, why do we even need neural networks for rendering? What, what can it give us? And I think there's a couple of, of different areas, but there's one specific area I would like to talk now from a computer vision standpoint. And in computer vision, what we have been trying to do for a long time, we've been trying to do reconstruction. Meaning we take a series of images, could be RGB, could be RGBD. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to create realistic, realistically looking reconstructions, right? We want to go ahead and capture our environment. We want to create a 3D representation from our environment that we can digitize. We want to understand these environments for robotics applications, for instance. Um, but we also want to use them, for instance, to capture memories, right? To replace photos in a sense and kind of have viewpoint, viewpoint synthesis, create holograms of people, create virtual avatars and stuff like that. And the challenge is basically, if you're looking at these images, computer vision has tried pretty hard to get these kind of reconstructions here, right? Um, that's an example from Kitty. That's a, a LiDAR data set. So of course, LiDAR is very sparse, but in, especially in outdoor environments, we see problems here, right? We, we see we, we're not getting perfect reconstructions. And we've tried pretty hard as a community for a long time. We've developed bundle adjustment methods. We've developed multi-view stereo methods. Um, we've developed you know, volumetric fusion methods for RGBD scanners and so on. Um, but this is what computer graphics looks like here on the right. When you have an artist creating a proper 3D model with proper textures and so on, you're going to get very, very high quality rendered images. And I think um, the big challenge basically 
what we're trying to solve um, as part of this like kind of 3D reconstruction, uh, 3D capture community is we want to get this like photolistic reconstruction, right? We want to figure out how do we make this part here look like that part. And I think this is my understanding what neural rendering is going to look like is, well, assuming we tried pretty hard to get really good reconstructions, but we're not quite getting there. We're trying to get this last little piece. We're trying to cheat a little bit in the reconstruction and say, maybe with imperfect reconstructions, we can use some neural rendering technique to get perfect uh, to the images out of it, even though the reconstruction itself wasn't perfect. Um, so I wanted to also give you a bit of an overview where I'm coming from. I don't want to start my talk with, oh, here's my neural network architecture. <laughs> so I want to start with a bit of a refreshing um, thing spot, what the good old days in my PhD was. So I actually started working on 3D reconstruction with RGBD sensors. This was like when the Kinect came out, everybody was like super hyped up because we had we had a, a, a very cheap commodity device for about, yeah, like a hundred bucks basically, right? And we, we could suddenly get RGBD data in real time, which was really amazing. Um, and I should say a lot of these cameras, right? They're still being produced and they're being now um, put on, on smartphones. Like the iPhone has a LiDAR scanner basically, right? Like this is pretty amazing. Like this kind of technology, is still very, very um, important. I mean, I, I've given a couple of talks why I think depth sensors are pretty good. Essentially, you have a question of how much compute versus how much um, well, space and energy you need. This is kind of a, a question for the hardware manufacturers what to do there. Um, but with these kind of depth sensors, right, there was a lot of work um, on volumetric fusion, like Kinect fusion was a big paper at the time. Um, and, and one of my very first papers actually was this voxel hashing paper, which I'm still pretty proud of because it was one of the papers where you could do volumetric fusion in real time, you get this reconstruction in real time um, without any spatial limitations. So you could basically go ahead and scan very large scenes. Uh, in real time, you get the reconstruction, the feedback immediately in real time. Um, and at the end of the day, you're gonna get results that look something like this here. So this is a reconstruction um, that yeah, admittedly we have been shaded and rendered it nicely, um, but it, it's a reconstruction you get in a real time reconstruction framework, right? Um, and a lot of the research actually we're doing today with deep learning um, is actually based on reconstructions like these ones because we're using this one, for instance, to train 3D neural network for semantic scene understanding. And it turns out doing 3D scene understanding has a lot of advantages of doing it in 2D, right? You don't have to learn viewpoint invariances. You, you basically need a whole lot less training data and you have much, much better generalizability in 3D than in 2D because you don't have the, um, the protection in there. Okay. Um, but yeah, the nice thing was we could do this kind of stuff in very large scenes. Um, this is another example here. Um, we did actually, uh, this is a sequence from Cambridge. Um, it was actually taken from another paper, but the, the, you see you can actually do very large um, yeah, reconstructions in real time. Um, we had a bit of problems at the beginning. Um, we always had the tracking was at this point not quite solved yet. So post estimation, I think um, we did basically a frame to frame ICP there, which was a bit, you know, brittle if you do things like loop closure. So basically the scan here started here, right? We went around, we came back, and then you see it doesn't quite fit here. Um, so we continued working on these lines for a little bit. Um, and this is what, what we what it did in 2017 um, was this bundle fusion work, which I think is still heavily being used. And um, I would say arguably it's, it's probably still one of the, if not the state of the art 3D reconstruction framework. Um, so what we did is we basically had a global bundle adjustment optimization where we took a set of sparse key points at this point still with uh, SIF features. Um, and um, we did this global pulse optimization. So we optimized for the reprojection accuracy of the features. Um, and from this like loop closure issues we had before, we could then in real time get a um, globally bundle adjusted uh, version uh, of 3D scene. And this all ran in real time, which I think was pretty remarkable. Um, and one of the things I should also say is um, this was in 2017 and, and I'm talking about this, this was already way in the past, right? It's like from the good old days, but it's not so long ago actually. Like these kind of things um, in, in computer vision and um, computer graphics was like a thing, yeah, like three, four years ago, like not everything was deep learning. And I'm still pretty excited about these kind of, um, well, system papers. Um, because you know you can show some really cool applications with it, and one of the applications we showed um, was that we could do this in real time. So here we had the uh, we had a structure sensor on an iPad. This is an iPad, and you see it has like this depth camera on top of it, um, and and you could basically yeah you could basically go around uh, and and then stream it. The, the reconstruction was not on the iPad in this case. We streamed it to the to the 
to the uh, desktop computer with Wi-Fi. Um, and then here on the bottom right, you saw the, the 3D reconstruction here, which I think um, is pretty cool because again, it runs in real time. It's a top-down view of, in this case, my office at Stanford. Um, yeah, and then you see as we continue, we see the, the live feed, uh, preview we see here and here. And then here you see now we have this loop closure issue, right, which is a common problem in SLAM systems. Um, but then here now the global bundle adjuster kicks in and uh, automatically figures out the pulses and adjusts the scene in real time. We could do relocalization actually too. So we could do glucose sensors. I mean, all the things that are, you know, um, now kind of a given in many in many data sets that you, you download, like if you download scan it and so on, these data sets have been actually reconstructed with these kind of methods. Um, and at the end of the day, you're gonna get reconstructions that look like this. Um, this is a, a copy room at Stanford. Um, you're gonna get, if you're looking closer, you're gonna get results that look like these ones. Um, and yeah, I mean, they look actually pretty good, right? So you would have said like, going back to this neural rendering question that I posed before, you would have said, well, this is a pretty good representation already. So we don't have to fix too much of this stuff, right? Um, and of course, these kind of images is what we're putting in the paper, right? This is when you wanna publish a paper, you pick the best reconstruction results you can see. Um, so here we see an example of my office, um, but in papers, of course, you do a little bit of cherry picking all this, right? And so what's happening is we took this top-down view because that's where we um, thought it looks pretty good. But if you're changing the, the, the viewpoint a little bit of the scene and you're looking at it from the bottom, it's the very same scene, you see that at the bottom, it doesn't look so great anymore, right? Um, so you quickly, you quickly see that we're missing a lot of the geometry here. Um, and, and it's very clear that this is nowhere near as good um, as we could put it in a movie or a video game. And, and obviously there's some broken parts in the reconstruction, right? So we're missing that. We simply didn't scan it. Um, and I should say even, even cutting edge neural rendering methods cannot fix these kind of problems to that degree, right? Like, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this. So we've been working um, mostly from a data-driven side um, to fix these kind of problems. And we wanted to do scene completion, right? We wanted to figure out priors with neural networks to take these partial scans and complete them. And this is one work we did um, two years ago at CVPR we called the scan complete. Um, so here we're having these like uh, partial 3D scans, right? Uh, this is a partial, a partial scene um, and it's always partial. And the argument that I had always with, um, <laughs> with the reviewers at this point was, well, I'm arguing you're always gonna have a partial scene because like just physically speaking, you can't scan everything. You're just missing a bunch of the pieces, right? But the idea was that you wanna fill in these, these holes here and wanna complete the scenes and wanna predict what the missing geometry is. Um, and in this case, we trained this on synthetic data and we got actually pretty good priors. Um, and it looked something like this, right? You have here the input scan. Um, and then after the completion, you, you're getting results that look like these ones, right? So um, it looks actually pretty good, right? You're getting, you're getting quite some, uh, they're getting also the semantics, you know, since we can do completion, we just add a semantic hat to it. Um, and that actually shows that these two things help each other, right? If you're adding, um, if you're doing good completion, by the way, you're getting much, much better results on semantics. The other way around doesn't help too much. It's kind of an interesting question. Um, and we worked on this even further, right? Um, and this year we actually had this SGNN paper, which um, I would argue from a like scene reconstruction, scene completion standpoint, um, this is actually pretty remarkable right now what we can do. If you're looking at the quality of the geometry here, um, at the fidelity, this is the input here, right? And this is the completion. You're missing a little bit of stuff here still, but for the most part, th this looks actually, um, yeah, looks actually pretty good, right? And yeah, I'm gonna, gonna try to play this one here again. So I think, I mean, this is pretty nice what we can do. One of the nice things about this one here is um, it actually is completely self-supervised. It doesn't need any, any synthetic training data anymore. It just works on, on real data. And the idea there is you just take a bunch of frames out and you try and predict the frames you took out from very incomplete to less incomplete. And this one, this way you can also learn the patterns to go to, to this pretty complete representation. Um, we're using a, a cutting edge uh, um, sparse conf architecture here on 3D and we're getting pretty good reconstructions. But yeah, even that one right now, um, we didn't do anything here with textures, right? We only fi figured out the, the geometry in this case. Um, and, and this is basically reposing the question that I said before, even with all the effort we're doing right now to fix the geometry, 
right? We're trying to do cutting edge reconstruction systems. We spend a lot of effort getting the poses right. Um, and if I show these kind of images, I'm like super excited about and probably hopefully a lot of you are too. Um, but if you're showing this to somebody outside the research field and, and they're looking at a movie and they're saying, well, this doesn't look like a movie. It looks like, like some research paper, right? It doesn't look like the real thing yet. So the question is, well, if we can't fix the reconstruction, why can't we change the rendering? And this is where the neural rendering part comes into play, right? Um, and again, there's a lot of a lot of people probably citing different origins of neural rendering. Um, but for me personally, and um, again, this is debatable. I'm not making a claim that this is the first starting point for neural rendering. But for me, this is basically the conditional GAN work um, uh, by by Philip Isola um, and, and the guys at Berkeley, um, Jun Yang, um, who is with uh, at CMU now. These people worked on this, in my opinion, for a, like from a graphics perspective, even they published it in Vision, right? I mean, from a graphics perspective, I think this was for me one of the first neural rendering work because what it's doing essentially, um, you can go ahead and say, well, you can like the pix to pix paper, of course, is very very famous and very popular, right? Um, you can go ahead and say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take um, a, a rendering which is kind of broken, right? And I'm training a CNN to figure out how to make it look realistic, right? I need a paired setting here, of course, right? Um, which is maybe a bit of a downside, um, but there's of course like cycle again and these kind of methods, they followed up on this completely unpaired setting. But basically the idea is give me broken, give me broken rendering, make it look better. They didn't publish it quite and post it in this case, in this way that I'm describing it, but this is for me what neural rendering means, right? Um, and of course, this one is just a sketch here, but you can just take our original photo here, like we took this kitty image and then you can say, oh, take this, this, this confident here and, and make it look like a nice image, right? Um, and, and that one in, in, in theory, I thought was, was great, right? You can apply this to many, many things. And we had a couple of papers on top of it, like the video portrays was that. Um, so yeah, I think that, that is, a, is, is, a pretty cool, um, is a pretty cool pipeline, generally speaking, right? Um, and now the question is, is this a good method in a sense to solve the neural rendering task? Because one thing what's happening here is this part in the middle here is typically a series of 2D convolutions, right? So you have a series of 2D convolutions. Uh, you have a bunch of reals and maybe batch norm or whatever unit architecture you want to put in in between. Um, but basically it's a series of 2D operators. And the challenge is if you want to do novel viewpoint synthesis with that and want to have a consistent 3D representation, it's going to be pretty tricky to get consistent renderings out of it. And we've done a simple experiment here. Um, we've taken a, 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 as, as input a, a pose and we wanted to render a novel pose of this cube. So we rendered it in the ground truth, right? We rendered a bunch of images and we wanted this conditional again. We just used the pix to pix code in this case um, to produce novel viewpoints. And globally speaking, it gets the structures very well, but locally speaking, it has of course a lot of artifacts um, because it's very tricky for this 2D network to replicate this 3D consistency. And that's a very hard, a hard very hard question to address, right? Um, so how do, how do we fix that? Well, one option is of course, we just add more layers and throw in more data, but scientifically that's not very satisfying. So we, we're thinking of, well, can we, can we somehow embed 3D operators into, into that network? Uh, and this is one thing we've tried in this deboxels um, method. This is um, what Vincent Sitzman has been leading. Um, He's, he's at MIT now, actually a postdoc. Um, so um, the idea of his work is, well, we, we, we just replace these 2D operators with 3D operators. And the way you can do that is you can just say, well, we're having a source image here. We're running a bunch of 2D convolutions, in this case, a 2D unit that gives us 2D features. We are back projecting these features with, uh, with, because we know the pose, let's say we know the pose of these images. We back project these to 3D. Um, and then we have a 3D voxel grid where we're running 3D convolutions. We have a 3D feature grid. Um, and then we're reprojecting these features again to 2D, right? So we have this lifting to 3D, 3D operators processing and back to 2D. And then we have a loss in the reprojection, right? Um, and if you're doing this, um, and I, it's a little bit simplified, and th there's one thing that I'm ignoring here, like in the reprojection, we don't have the depth, so there has to be a depth estimation kind of happening. Um, but that's not the key point what I'm going to make. The key point what I want to make here is if most of the stuff is learned in 3D, you're going to get with the same training data, much better consistent rendering. Um, and it's something like this. Um, so it's the same training data here. It's the same number of images and roughly the same, the same size network. 
And the idea is, of course, well, we have these 3D operators, and because of that, like the text here looks way, way better, right? It's just easy to learn, right? This is a very simple thing um, because we just back projected it to 3D, and in 3D, you don't have these, these challenges that you need to learn, like rotations and so on, right? It's just much easier. So, the voxel, in a sense, is significantly better than a naive 2D unit. Um, but if you're looking closely, you're still going to have a bunch of issues. And one issue is here on the side. If you're looking at these creasing angles, I hope you can see them. Uh, these creasing angles actually appear through the voxel resolution because our 3D grid is an explicit 3D grid, right? Um, and that's, in a sense, a weakness because we're running out of memory eventually. And because of this discretization of the features in 3D, you're going to get these, these swimming artifacts here on the side. I mean, I hope you can see them in Zoom. But yeah, this is basically the, the larger issue here. Um, so how do we fix it? Well, we thought, why don't we do this with a traditional renderer um, and follow up what graphics people are doing? And people in graphics, what they're doing is a thing called deferred rendering. There's no neural network involved. So the idea is, uh, in deferred rendering, you're going to take 3D geometry. You render all the properties into a G buffer, a geometry buffer. And the geometry buffer is something like albedo, depth, normal, and, and lighting. These are just, on a per frame basis in screen space, the respectively rendered outputs. Uh, and then you have a renderer coming afterwards. And this render afterwards makes an image out of this, right? It takes, it does the, the, the whole shading and everything on a per pixel basis. And, and this is the idea of what we're doing with this neural texture idea. We're doing the same thing as deferred rendering. Um, so we're taking the three geometry of something that is reconstructed. We have textures on this reconstruction that is n-dimensional. Um, I don't know what's in this texture yet, but it's some n-dimensional feature on the surface. We are rendering these ones into 2D. We're going to get some sample 2D texture here. Um, and this is our, our neural G buffer now, so to say. And then we have a unit renderer that creates an image out of it. And the idea is that we're training this whole pipeline here end to end, and we're optimizing what features does our texture have to store in order to locally describe the appearance even though the reconstruction might be a bit broken. So this reconstruction of this, this is a globe actually, and we reconstructed that with, um, with the multi stereo method. Um, even that one here right now um, looks pretty broken, right? But we want to create this one as output. So we kind of, these neural textures here, they, they're storing some, some appearance. We don't know what it is, it's some appearance. Um, and then we're rendering it. And then we have a 2D unit that makes out of these features a real image again. And yeah, this is trained end-to-end. -end. This is kind of a, a basic version of a differential renderer here. Um, and then instead of doing this deferred rendering pipeline we've seen before, we basically have a deferred neural rendering pipeline where we have neural features in 2D and we have learned feature maps that we're then using in this, in this, in this reconstruction. And, and this is something we've tried for a couple of applications, right? We're trying this for novel viewpoint synthesis, um, for scene editing, and for animation synthesis like face editing and stuff. Um, so the idea is the same as before. And in contrast now to just taking a standard conditional GAN, the features live in 3D. And we already have this rendering, this projection step hard coded. But since it is differentiable, we can train it end to end. Um, and if you're doing this, we're getting results like these ones here. So here we have um, the rendered UV. And here's the reconstruction that the unit gives us then with the rendering. And this one is actually already pretty good. So this one's for novel viewpoint synthesis. We're getting actually pretty good reconstructions. Um, if you're comparing this to the ground truth, um, I think it's pretty hard to see the difference here. I think for this sequence, it works remarkably well. Admittedly, it's, it's one object right now, right? Um, but for this one object, I think you're getting pretty good reconstructions. Um, so if you are pushing this further, um, we're doing here scene editing. We have here, these are our input views. This is the reconstruction we're getting. We're using ColdMap in this case uh, to get the multi-view reconstruction. And now what we do is we simply copy paste the, the statue here uh, two more times into the scene, along with its neural pixels that are associated with the geometry. So we have, because of the 3D representation, we have full explicit control over that, right? So we can copy paste stuff and edit things, right? Um, and that's what we're getting as an output here. So this is the original one, and this is the edited one. Right. I'm going to show this again. 
this is the input one, right? And this is the edited one. Um, I think it looks pretty good, um, except a few flaws. <laughs> one of the flaws that we're having is we don't see, we only see the shadow of the of the middle one here. We don't see it on the other ones. And it's very simple because our renderer is just a forward renderer. We don't have any indirect effect in the rendering. Um, and because of that, you know, you don't get the rest. It's very simple. Uh, we tried this for faces too, um, our, our favorite hobby. <laughs> uh, so for faces, we can also do the same thing for the, the face mask. So what we're doing is of this Obama video, we're cutting out the face. And we have the UV map. We optimize the neural textures. And what we get in here is the, the synthesized output. And because we have a 3D face mask, we can drive that with some source video. Right. And the driving of the source video works by track this face, just animate this face here, and, and then you can synthesize novelties. Um, and let's see if, if this works out. Man, why? I, I would really say Kevin, probably. I would have to say Kevin. Man, why? Uh, Kevin's a little spirit. If I play, he would have been happy. Man, why? I, I would really say Kevin, probably. I would have to say Kevin. Man, why? All right, uh, we've got another one here. I joined Google 15 years ago and have been privileged to serve as CEO for the past few years. So I would say these ones look actually um, yeah, pretty, pretty good already. Um, the question is how far, what can we do with it more, right? Um, and one thing, um, let me actually do one thing. Let me quickly try to make sure that I'm sharing the audio too. Okay, sorry, I'm quickly stopping the presentation right now. I think it's a bit hard to hear for you, right? Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just replay this one. I joined Google 15 years ago and I've been privileged to serve as CEO for the past three years. Okay, so the idea now is we can synthesize that stuff and decondition it on some other input, but we can of course do this also from audio now. We can go ahead and say, we're taking an audio signal as input, we're driving our reconstructed face model, even though the face model is not accurate, our neural renderer will make it look realistic again. And we're using basically the neural texture technique. So the result looks something like that. So we have the English audio, we have a German news anchor kind of, and then we're trying to animate the face here based on whatever the audio is doing. That rain will gradually sink its way slowly southward into the far north of England, northwest Wales. Some clear skies, though developing in Scotland, temperatures overnight, eight to 12 degrees Celsius, but for the bulk of England and Wales, clear skies. Okay, and the pipeline looks something like this. Um, what we're doing basically is we're taking the audio input here on the very left. Uh, we're having deep speech as a pre-processing of the audio to get some features. Um, then we have an ex uh, feature extraction network um, and we're mapping this one to the expression parameters of the face model. We have a personalized expression basis that is trained for one video. So every video has person specific traits like how that person is speaking. Uh, we're getting the 3D model, we're optimizing for the neural textures here, and then we can rendering the respective output. Um, and this part here is channelized actually, and this part here is specialized on one video. And you can train it on like, I don't know, like a thousand frames or so, it's probably okay. And the results look something like this. Again, science makes progress by steps. Most of those steps are small, some are slightly bigger. Uh, seen from the outside, sometimes people have the impression that, oh, there's this big breakthrough, breakthrough, and journalists like to talk about breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. But actually, science is very, very progressive because we gradually understand better the world. Yeah, so I think it's actually pretty cool what you can do with it. Um, and I'm very excited about this direction because basically you can combine like different conditionings with neural, neural um, rendering techniques. Um, and the advantage of this neural texture method is, or this one here is, you have explicit control, right? So depending on what you have here as input, um, like the face model or so, you can basically like control, um, you can control what you're synthesizing at the end of the day. So this is very nice. So we have explicit control and I think that's good. Um, the one small downside what we're having right now is, it's mostly a two-step process. In a sense, 
first we do the reconstruction offline, like either face tracking or multi view stereo. And then the null rendering optimization is happened with the fixed reconstruction. And I think it would have been fantastic if you could do both of these things at the same time. If you basically learn the reconstruction while optimizing for the rendering. Um, and this is something that people have actually been doing recently. Um, you might not necessarily recognize it this way, but this is essentially what the, the nerf work is doing. So the neural radiance work um, uh, by Berkeley and Google essentially, what these guys have been doing, they're doing this at the same time. And this is a work um, and a line of research I'm extremely excited about. I think this is fantastic. Um, it's a fantastic new refreshing idea that um, actually it has nothing to do with, with, with machine learning in a sense. It's basically an optimization to do good reconstruction and good re-rendering. And yeah, I think it's a, it's a really simple idea actually. So what these guys are doing, they're going ahead and saying, um, you basically want to do multi-view stereo reconstruction. So you're having as input a bunch of images like these two here, um, and you have a ray through every pixel here. And along this ray, you're going to have a bunch of samples that, that represent a radiance. And the final color in this image here is going to be the integral across along the radiance along this ray. The same counts for that ray here on the right. And what you're doing right now is you have a lot of these rays. Um, and what you're trying to do is basically you're trying to globally optimize such that all of these rays fulfill the colors that are observed in the respective images, right? And if you're having enough images, you're going to get enough constraints that the idea is that the, the actual radiance here will be actually at the intersection here. So it will be on the surface where you're actually storing um, the color and the, and the, and the densities, right? Um, and the idea is, of course, the more images you have, the more constrained this process gets. And you just globally optimize across all views and all rays simultaneously, right? Um, and yeah, your ground truth here in the loss function is just whatever image colors or pixel colors what you have observed. So in principle, it's, it's only a multi-view stereo reconstruction, um, but that's not a negative thing. I think that's a very positive thing because they're globally optimizing for that. Um, and the second contribution they're making is they're storing this reconstruction not as a set of voxels here, but they're storing it as an implicit function. And this function f is essentially a bunch of NLPs, um, how they're storing it. And so what they're doing is then they're feeding as input to the MLP, they're feeding the X, Y, Z coordinate as input and the, the camera pose, sort of the camera or uh, the orientation of the ray. Um, and they're getting um, for a given X, Y, and Z, for a given X, Y, and Z point here, uh, they're getting the color and the density, right? And this is what they're optimizing for. And again, the more views they have in principle, the more over constrained it is. Um, this here is a little bit misleading because the, the, the angle of the viewing is actually fed in later to the MLP. This is one of the things how they get it to work. It's, it's an implicit regularization, so to say. Um, it's not so important right now. I mean, they show really cool view dependent effects, but the really nice thing I think is that they, they do this multi-view consistency optimization um, with, this, yeah, with, with this formulation of the volumetric rendering, right? And I think that's pretty cool. Um, and these guys have shown really remarkable results. I mean, I'm sure most of you guys have seen that. Um, and, and that of course sparked a lot of interest in the community. Um, it's actually already at a point where there's a website right now um, that lists nerf papers that came out. And these nerf papers, um, they came out literally in the last two weeks. There come a lot of follow-up papers around it. And I think it's, a, it's, it's very exciting. Um, and in a sense, we are one of these people too, who are also working in that field. And what, what we wanted to do though, is we wanted to combine the, the ideas what we had before on things like neural textures. We wanted to have, again, explicit control of what we are rendering, right? We don't just want to have a black box renderer. Um, and this is something we're doing with dynamic radiance fields. So the idea here is that we are taking a monocular input sequence similar to NERF. We're constructing a dynamic radiance field. And I'll explain that what this means in practice. Um, and the idea is we can do two things. We can not only do novel poses, we can do novel poses, right? So we can change the appearance. Um, but the advantage here right now is we don't need to have the person here doesn't have to be a static image or a static person. Like the person can move around and be getting still the novel post reconstruction. 
Um, but in addition to controlling the novel pose in the neural rendering, we also want to control the expressions of the person. So we want to make the person smile, for instance, and so on. And we want to have explicit control over that. So we can't just have this to be a, a black box laid in space, but instead we need to anchor it with, let's say, a 3D model or something. Um, and this is something what we've been doing. Um, but we also wanted to do both, of course, at the same time. So we wanted to novel poses and novel expressions, right? So we wanted to combine these two. And this basically gives us like a full 4D avatar, right? So we can change poses and we can change uh, the expressions accordingly. Um, yeah, it's good. A few more examples here. Um, and we can also do reenactment scenarios again. So stuff like this, right? So we have an input source that controls then the respective output. And here both, both is controlled, right? It's the expressions as well as the, uh, the novel view. So if the person changes around, um, it's actually not the novel view, it's just the rigid head pose. <laughs> but if you know all the previous work, work papers for reenactment, they can't do the novel pose of the head. Okay, so question, how does it work? Um, the idea is we're having the input frames. And the first thing is we're gonna do is we're gonna track the face. So in this case, uh, we're taking a 3D morphable model. We're taking actually a, the state of the artist face tracker here. Uh, we're using that to reconstruct the pose. So we're getting a rotation and a, and a translation um, for, for, for the images, right? Um, we're gonna get the camera intrinsics, FX, FY, CX, CY. Um, we also gonna get the expressions. This is great out right now, but I wanna say our 3D morphal model reconstructs these ones too. So we have a, a 37 dimensional vector of the PCA expressions of the blend shapes of that specific person. And what do we do now? Well, we, we, we first, the first thought is what we've been tried starting this project, we just running now. Um, the idea is, well, we uh, go ahead and do a few ray sampling, right? So based on the posts, based on the intrinsics, uh, we just doing the ray sampling, we're feeding this into a MLP. Um, we're predicting for every point then, we predict when we sample these rays here and we resample the pixels, we're predicting the radiances and the, uh, sorry, the densities and the um, RGB values. Um, we're integrating all of the rays and then we're doing volumetric rendering again, right? This is very similar to what NERF is doing. Um, and we tried that and you see, it looks for the face itself. It doesn't look terrible, actually. It's surprising that this doesn't completely fall apart. Um, but the background is completely broken at this point, right? The, the background is like this background here is missing. So the first thing what we did is we wanted to fix the background. So here yeah, you can see that the background is kind of broken. And if you run NERF on a dynamic scene, you're getting results to look mostly like these ones. Um, so now if we're adding the background, how can we fix the background? It's actually not so difficult because what we do is we simply take one image of the background that we recorded uh, and we're feeding in the background constraints into the volumetric uh, rendering at the end, right? Because we know now when a ray hits the background, we, we, we simply know that, oh, it has to have these constraints here, right? Um, and if you're doing this and combining that, it already looks a lot better. Uh, let me see if that works, okay? So if you do that with this background image, it looks like that, right? Um, so it looks a lot better. <laughs> so we have the background. Um, and now what we wanna do next is, well, of course we can animate it now. And now the animation basically animates the uh, head pose, right? And we can do basically the, the analog to novel viewpoint synthesis for novel head pose synthesis, right? Um, okay, uh, now we wanna add the dynamics in. And what we did is we haven't used these expression vectors yet. So the first idea is we're taking these expressions and we're feeding it also as condition into the dynamic gradient scale vector. And basically the idea is Similar to multi view stereo constraints, now we have been constrained that if you have a long enough sequence that we have similar expression being seen multiple times, you're going to get these cross expression con uh, constraints, right? And if you're doing this, we can go ahead and, uh, and, and animate things, right? Um, in a test time, of course, we can just change them then later. Um, okay, let me show a few examples here. So now, now we can animate the person. Um, but by the way, you need pretty good tracking of the face. If the face is not properly tracked, this doesn't work so well. Um, okay, so this one looks pretty good if you're comparing this. Um, so if you're taking here, again, this is the ground truth. 
the ground truth, we just recorded a long enough sequence as, an, as a self reenactment, so to say, right? So we have the ground truth, we have no expression conditioning here. And you see it's, it's uh, yeah, it's always the same image. And then with the expression conditioning, it's, it's getting very sharp and it also moves them over time. Okay, so in principle, this one worked to some degree, but if you're looking at the images very closely, it's a bit hard to see over Zoom, I think. Um, but if you're looking very closely, it's going to be a little bit blurry. -o. And we thought, well, we wanted to fix fix these kind of things, especially on the torso. It's a bit hard to see here. Can I quickly back? If you're looking at the torso here, you see this is not quite right. And the reason why it's not quite right is because the face model only captures the face mask and not the rest of the upper body. And but you're still moving here around, right? So this is kind of an issue. And so what we thought is, well, we thought about, can we somehow represent the rest of these uh, dynamics? Uh, and what we did is we, on a per frame basis, we learn an additional latent code. It's kind of similar to what um, DBSDF and these papers have been doing. So we're kind of learning a, a latent code on a per frame basis that encodes the additional dynamics. So it's just an encoding that the network can use uh, in order to represent the rest of the dynamics. And now we're feeding this, this le learnable codes, we're also feeding into the dynamic gradients code. Um, these ones here are harder to control because they have no semantic information. But these ones here, the expressions and the poses, they are. So test time, this is harder to control, but these ones are. Um, and you might have seen also some of the other parallel works that came out recently. Um, they do this trick too, but they don't do this trick with the expression. So they don't have the explicit control. And this is kind of different what we're doing there. OK. Um, yeah, how does it look with this latent code? And it actually looks better. So especially if you're looking here in this region, so this ground truth, right? You see this very sharp here. Here it's not so sharp. Um, and now here we see that it gets a lot sharper here, right? And let me actually get a little bigger here, right? You see it's here, it's very blurry. Oh, it's a bit blurry and here it becomes very sharp. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at a few more of the examples. Um, here's the, uh, the, the pose here. Right. Um, you can do novel pulse synthesis. You can change the expressions uh, accordingly. And the nice thing again, it's the good thing is that we have full control here. Uh, what's also remarkable is actually if you're looking at the at the surface models that I estimated along with the method, we're getting actually pretty good results on that one too. Um, it's a little noisy, right? If you're thinking about it, uh, all what we're doing right now and all what NERC is doing too, it's basically doing a reconstruction. I mean. Yeah, I know we're all calling it AI and learnable, but the cool thing is this is just pure optimization in order to get the to get a, an actual reconstruction of the scene. And I think that's that's super exciting. And it's pretty remarkable actually. If you're looking here at the mouth, right? We're getting all the details here. Okay, we have another example here. So you see that our representation actually learns the dynamics um, of the face here. Okay. Um, yeah, let's have a few comparisons. So we had a few comparisons here. This is against the video portraits, and this is what we did before. Basically, this is a 2D version, but it's using pix to pix, a, a better, it's like a temporal version of pix to pix, basically. Um, and it uses conditioning from a face model, so it also has somewhat realistic views, um, but it's a it's a bit challenging. And this is a first order motion models. That was a cool paper that came out last year. Um, also produces pretty good results. Um, uh, they try to generalize, um, so they're solving a little bit of a harder task. Um, but the, the, the result quality, if you look here on the right, doesn't look that great. And if you're playing this, you see that we're producing actually really good results here. Like if you're looking just at the eyes, right? If you're looking at the reflections here, uh, if you're looking at the mouth, and like here, like it always has some problems here, right? Um, and I think that looks really good, actually. Um, if you're having another one here, um, yeah, look at here, like the, the hair here looks actually really good, right? But here the hair doesn't look so great. Let me turn it again. But here the mouth is a bit broken, whereas our mouth looks actually pretty remarkably good. Having another sequence here. Yeah, I see the same same problems here, right? It doesn't like doesn't look that great, or here it breaks open. Okay, um, and 
We can also do reenactment with it. That's what I've already shown you. Um, I didn't spend too much effort on this one, but I mean, this was just a nice side effect, right? You can basically take this as input, take this as output, take this as input, and this creates as output, which I, I think is kind of nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, coming back to the beginning of my talk, <laughs> why I think neural rendering is so cool. Um, I think it's really cool now because basically we're not learning anything anymore, right? I mean, this is purely optimization based. I mean, you can argue there's, there's, there's some learning. Of course, this is all based with deep learning frameworks, right? This is MLPs, this is scene representations um, and so on. But in a sense, there's no learning to sort of say uh, that, that you're trying to hallucinate anything right now. This is a pure multi-view reconstruction of dynamics, what we've just shown you, or NERF is a pure reconstruction of statics, what, 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 what they have shown you, right? Um, but I think it's a really cool application domain, basically, like thinking about it, when you want to go from here on the left to these photorealistic reconstructions, right? And the thing why the latest works I'm very excited about is basically they do both at the same time, right? They do the reconstruction and the re-rendering is optimized simultaneously. And there's still a few things that are broken in these kind of things. It's like horrendously slow. It takes forever to render. So, um, but globally speaking, I think of course um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of excitement in how to move these kind of things forward. One big question is how much can the neural part do? How much do you want to? How how much price do you need in the reconstruction versus how much do you fix in the rendering? Right. That's that's an open question, I think. Um, but I think you should do both at the same time. So here's an example we have done in, in, in the neural texture paper. Uh, we just have a UV map on a box here and we have the neural texture of a vase on top of it. So even though the geometry of this box is completely broken, uh, you still can reproduce some of the results here, right? Um, and this is kind of a thing what you're often seeing in, in 2D GANs when you're taking um, like the, the state of the art GAN papers. They mostly look good up to a certain point, but then then you're kind of stuck. You don't know how to fix the rest of it. And this is a thing as a research community we still have to address. And I believe doing it with these kind of neural 3D representations, I think it's kind of it's kind of very nice. Um, and why is it cool? Well, I mean, there's of course a lot of amazing applications to it. Um, eventually, we want to digitize everything. We want to build holograms, right? Um, and we want to capture our memories. We want to replace photos and videos with some 3D representations. And I think that's going to be like really amazing in a sense of you know, working along these lines. So it's going to be pretty cool. And I'm very excited also what the next half year brings um, in, in terms of research, because like in the last year, one, in the last one or two years, I think there has been an incredible amount of really, really cool work. And I think it's very nice um, to be part of it. Um, I also want to thank, um, I want to kind of conclude my talk. I want to thank all my students and um, people in my lab. Uh, I also want to thank all of our external collaborators, um, like Michael Zoller from Facebook, who uh, was part of the of the dynamic nerve paper um, and, and many other people from the MPI, from Christian Theobald's lab and so on. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And I hope we still have a bit of time for questions. I'm happy to have some discussions. Thanks. Okay, uh, time for some questions. I see some question in the chat for sure. Uh, Okay, there was one question wondering the software has a concept of chair, sofa, and pillows. I guess you were referring to the um, yes. to the semantic completion work, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what we do basically, it's very interesting. When you do scene completion and you basically have a, a loss that tries to predict the rest of the geometry that is missing, um, we were hoping we had this, actually not only we, several people at the same time had this idea of if we know the semantics, if we know the concepts of what, what a sofa is and stuff like this, um, we would get better completion results, right? We would thought, well, there's a prior, like, you no, know, it's a sofa. Even if getting the ground truth of the semantics there, it didn't really improve the completion quality. It was very interesting. And we tried pretty hard to prove that point. We tried a lot of things um, and we wanted to publish a paper around it, but it didn't work like that. Um, what we did learn though is that if we had the completion, we got significantly better features for semantics. So this way always helped. The other way around barely. Like we had to try pretty hard for that. Um, and one, one hypothesis around this is if you're doing just generally image classification or semantic segmentation with neural networks is 
these networks don't do what they, what we think they do. They don't learn any high level concepts. I think what they're doing, they're just learning low level features and they're doing pooling over it. And on some kind of majority vote later down in the later layers of a network, you're gonna assign a class label to it. And that was a bit disappointing in a sense. Um, I might be wrong here, I don't know. I mean, would, would be happy also to hear th some opinions, um, but I think we're not really, like when we're doing a, a, a classifier or semantic segmentation methods, we're not really high level structures and concepts. This is not happening in these days, I think. Thank you. Bob has a question. No, here's a point. There's two questions actually. Thanks. Um, so one question is, I mentioned training, rendering performance is an issue with NERF. What are some other big challenges? Um, well, I mean, from generally speaking, NERF and also what we're doing is, is currently under pretty controlled settings, right? I mean, basically all of these papers, they're, they're using high quality SLR data. Like this is not, cell, this is not some, some random blurry uh, capture that we took with a webcam, right? Um, this is something we still have to be aware of. And in, in fairness, right, if you're, if you're comparing it even to the RGBT reconstruction frameworks earlier, um, these ones use cheaper sensors than NERF, right? Um, so they're still getting this to work in generic large environments is, is still pretty fundamentally challenging. I don't think they're quite there yet. Um, efficiency is one part of it, like how to scale it up to large environments. It's also a question of, yeah, then the rendering speed, of course, it's very slow right now. Um, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff happening on these ends too, I think, but yeah, basically, um, yeah, I don't know, making it more generic. Um, another thing what people, I think, are just starting to look at is lighting and materials. It's the same question, right? If you want to do um, like lighting changes in the scene. Um, I haven't checked archive today yet. <laughs> like, given that you have to check it almost every day, you could basically assume that um, this might have appeared today that somebody works on it. I, I would I would be surprised if there's no NERF submission to um, to CVPR or any any other conference right now that is not dealing with um, like relighting or so on. I would be surprised. Couple of papers last night. You're right. Sorry, what do you say? A couple of papers last night. You're right. Oh, okay, sorry. I haven't read it today, but <laughs> so it's, um, but I think it's 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 amazing how fast this goes. But basically, like doing it all together right now, then doing dynamics, lighting in larger scene environments. I think there's still a couple of things to get this to work. I mean, what's gonna happen is right, research will exploit the, the current formulation to some degree, and then we're gonna have to, again, take a deeper dive. What are the, what are the larger goals that we can fix right now? Um, okay, there's another, um, our eyes might do the same thing. We actually see a, a lot less in a scene than we think we do. Um, Great point. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, just, yeah there, there, there are like, you know, disturbing uh, 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 visual things where you can like, you know, you see things that aren't there and then you don't see something that is there, right? We, we actually only see little bits of a scene and then we put it together. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think neural networks do the same thing to some degree, right? Um, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that, I think it's a pretty interesting question actually. What do we need to see in order to make these decisions, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, are there any other comments or questions? I mean, it's actually, by the way, this is our social our social event right now. We, we don't have any other social communications. So now is a good time to chat. I'm always happy to chat with people. Uh, maybe one last question. Is there anyone? Okay, Matthias, maybe I'll end, end with one last question and it's, it's a bit of a, bit of a pushback, sorry. Uh, uh, in all the view synthesis paper, nobody shows nearest neighbors. Why is, why is that? <laughs> I, I can give you the honest answer. I think the nearest neighbors looks pretty good. Um, if you're taking these data sets right now, and um, I, I think that it's, it's not a, I think it's a, it's a fantastic comment, by the way. I think there's a lot of great um, novel viewpoint synthesis with classical methods. And one thing, of course, you just take the nearest image. And the next best thing is kind of to take the n nearest neighbors and then do some interpolation between the nearest viewpoints, right? Um, and this is a thing that people had been doing in graphics, um, I think in the 90s already, at least, if not earlier, I would be surprised if earlier. So this classic image-based rendering field was pretty big then. Um, I think there was one very popular paper from Paul Debevec, actually. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that one, I think if you even apply this to this kind of data, Mm -hmm. You're getting pretty good results. One o'clock. I'm sorry. 
that's my machine, sorry. Okay, <laughs> and you're getting pretty good results and you're having a bit of trouble with few dependent effects, but the diffuse parts, I think they're getting pretty good. I think it's very hard to beat it. And there was another cool paper by, by Peter Hitman, I think. Um, he had mm -hmm. a couple of lines on, um, they, they had this one paper, Deep Blending, which I yeah. found pretty cool. So they're learning basically how to blend different images together in order to get novel viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, I have to say, I think these papers should have been also a bit more discussed in the whole Nerve papers as well, because they're right. providing actually really good results. Even better results, I think, to some degree than a lot of these small rendering techniques do right, right. now. Um, but I think, if you, I, I'm thinking about it more from an abstract perspective. It's these papers basically say, okay, you don't have to encode everything in your neural network, but rather go ahead and learn how to take the existing data and recombine it. Right. And and there's a there's a big big advantage in that, right? You can basically scale it up much larger, and you don't have to make your network much bigger. Hmm. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of these methods. It's not right. so clear yet how to get the the few dependent effects in, though. That's a bit harder, I would argue. Right. But, right. I would love to see more on this one, by the way. If you if you are interested in neural rendering, yeah, maybe don't don't focus on nerve right now. Maybe focus a bit on 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 like, you know, like I don't know, do differentiable version of nearest neighbor lookups yeah. and then the images or so, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, yeah very good comment. I think um, we should also be very very well aware that traditional graphics based nearest neighbor slash blending techniques are actually doing pretty well in these scenes too. Yeah. For dynamics, it doesn't work. That one I have to say, like for the like for faces or so, I think that would not work so easily. But for static scenes, it works very well. Right. All right. Any other question? Or I'm really running already over time. <laughs> if not, we should thank the speaker once again. Okay, let's thank Matthias. Thank you. Let me stop the recording.